So stand with me, if you would, out of respect for the reading of God's Word. In Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 2. Now remember the context here. Philippians 4 is that great chapter about God-given peace. I want you to notice how the chapter opens up. Paul writes, I beseech Yodius and Syncety that they be of the same mind in the Lord. In other way, words, that's a really nice way of the Apostle Paul saying, Ladies, get along. Get along. You need to stop the mess. You need to bury the hatchet. You need to be one in Christ. That's a really nice way of saying all that. And so that is really the beginning there of that great chapter on God-given peace. Now, how do we accomplish that? Because how many of us know that um, problems be a real thing we deal with every day? How do we do it? How do we do this as Christians? How do we pursue peace in this avenue of forgiveness? Let's look, if you would, at Ephesians chapter number 4. We're going to look at verses 31 and 32. Here the Bible says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Father, in these brief moments we have together tonight, I pray that you would use your word. Father, speak through your word. Hide me behind the cross of Christ. Lord, this is a, often a very difficult subject matter because it deals with very difficult things. And it deals with difficult people and difficult problems and, and difficult circumstances and, and, and difficult burdens and difficult baggage. And it, it's difficult. And Father, tonight I pray that you would give us the grace to not only assess but to, Father, a Attack this issue in our lives that we might truly pursue the peace that you have promised us in Christ. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we have looked at on Wednesday nights here at Harvest, in a world that is falling to pieces, peace is still available through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Peace is still available. He is the Prince of Peace. The Bible says for you and I who know him that he is our peace. That he gives us peace with God. That he gives us the grace to have peace with one another. That he gives us peace through his power. You remember that first sermon we preached on this, control issues? In other words, we have a lot more peace when we trust that God has enough power to do what he said he's going to do. We have peace through his power. We have peace through his provision. You remember the second sermon, contentment. In other words, my provisions may change, or my my positions may change, but God's provision for me is constant, so we have peace through his provision. We saw last week how we have peace through his process. In other words, having our mind transformed. Formed and thinking on those things. And we have learned, church, that peace is not the absence of chaos. If that were the case, none of us could have peace because this world is chaotic. Peace is not the absence of chaos, nor is peace the absence of a burden. But peace is the appropriation of the riches that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is confidence in Christ. So tonight is indeed our final installment of this series of this topic. What we're going to look at tonight is a major barrier to many. You know, whenever we talk about the idea of forgiving or forgiveness, that very word conjures up a lot of emotions in a lot of people. You know, to be honest, some people hear that word and it immediately takes them to a person or it takes them to a place or it takes them to a particular happening. And to be honest, they don't want to forgive. It still hurts too much. You know, there are other people who hear that word and they don't even believe it's possible anymore. Because they feel like they have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, but not succeeded. Some don't want it. Others don't believe it's possible, yet the guilt or the grudge 
that plagues your life doesn't have to overcome you. But it can be overcome through the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to know tonight that as we start, I am in no way trying to belittle what anybody has been through. Because I understand, in this world, people carry major hurt. But that doesn't change the reality that in Christ we are victors, not victims. And we can, by His grace, overcome. So understanding tonight what forgiveness is, is important. Forgiveness is simply the act of letting go. Some might say it's the act of releasing our right to attitudes of resentment. Our right to acts of retaliation. Even letting go of releasing our right to have an expectation of restitution. It is the letting go of or the releasing of frustrations and grudges and the baggage of our past. We all face this. We all need this. And hallelujah, God has provided a strategy for us to overcome and find His peace even in this chaotic, hurtful world. So would you look with me tonight? Ephesians chapter 4, we'll start in verse number 31, where Paul writes, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I want you to note first our human reality. Our human reality. We mentioned earlier, it's no coincidence that Philippians 4, a a great discourse on God-given peace, starts by dealing with strife that's found between people in the local church. As you look through the scriptures and you see what the, God, what the Bible says about humanity and what Jesus says about our reality as Christians, the, the great thing that we find here is that the Bible presupposes that offenses will come. In other words, there's not a great question that in this life you will be offended, you will face hurt and opposition, it will come will come. Here's a good little math formula for you. People plus personalities produce problems. People plus personalities produce problems. And here's the crazy thing. Well, you say, you know what? I'm just going to isolate. This world is nuts. You people are nuts. I'm just going to isolate myself from everybody. Guess what, bucko? You're stuck with yourself. No getting away from that. And so offenses will come. And and it really is made worse by the fact that we live in a culture that relishes perpetual offense. That everybody is offended by everything all the time. We see in verse number 31... This idea of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, all of those things are what our human fleshly responses are to something that is negative or hurtful in this life. The human reality is offenses will come. But here's the danger. Wrongs, both real and perceived, lead to hurts. Hurts lead to anger. Anger leads to burdens, baggage, and bitterness. Bitterness is sin. And sin always destroys. James chapter 1 and verse number 15 is very clear about that. Sin, when it is finished, brings Fourth, death. You know, one of the ways that the Bible describes this idea of unforgiveness or bitterness, it describes it as a 
root. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 15 is that reference there. It describes it as a root. And the thing about roots is this, is roots are generally underground. They are hard to detect until they have dug in and produced fruit. You know, I look at my yard right now, and the grass isn't green. It's not. If yours is, kudos, I'm still waiting on mine. The grass isn't green. I fed it. I did the weed and feed in the spring. I did the weed and feed in the fall. I spend good money on that yard. I spend more good money on my yard than I do my kids, I feel, sometimes. Yet here we are. It's almost April. The grass isn't green, but the weeds are. The weeds are. I'm going to tell you, that's how bitterness works. Those roots dig down deep, and you don't even hardly see them from the outside until they build up and produce fruit. You know, turning our hearts and turning our hurts into bitterness and baggage is one of the devil's favorite tricks. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse 10 and 11, verse 10, Paul reminds them about forgiveness and emphasizes about forgiveness. And whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes for, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Why? Why is, this for, why is this so important? Verse number 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I'm going to tell you, the devil doesn't set up strongholds in our lives over things that don't matter. The devil's not going to take your food allergy and set up a stronghold in your life because I, he doesn't really care if you can eat shellfish or not. But what the devil's going to do is he's going to take that hurt. He's going to take that wrong, and he wants to use it to build a stronghold in your life, to build bitterness and unforgiveness, to take that thing that you did even and to build guilt in your life, to take the thing someone else did and build a grudge in your life. Because what happens is when the devil is able to take that and build it into a stronghold, the devil can take a problem and he can turn it into your prison. The thing about bitterness is, if you've ever struggled with it, the word that keep coming back to is you just feel stuck. And the devil turns a problem into a prison. You know what else the devil does? The devil takes something personal and turns it into a plague. So look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 15 again. Uh, not only did it tell us that this idea of bitterness, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, but look at the end of the verse. And thereby many be defiled. Because the thing about unforgiveness, the thing about unresolved issues, the thing about bitterness is, is it doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you as well. It allows Satan to take a personal issue and turn it into a plague. It allows Satan to destroy by division. You know, Satan desires to undo what God has done. God desires to take and make one. You think about marriage, for instance, where God took two and said they are no more two but one flesh. You think about the church, where, where, where in Christ, it doesn't matter if we're old, we're young, we're male, we're female, we're, uh, whether, whether, we, whether we are bond or free, whether we are black or white or, or, or anything else. In Christ, we are one. You know what Satan likes to do? He likes to take that which God has put together and divide it up. God makes many into one. Satan breaks up one to make many. You see, this thing about wrong and hurt and anger and wrath, James chapter 1 and verse number 20 simply reminds us that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So we've got to start by acknowledging our human reality. We will find offenses and hurts and wrongs and guilt and grudges in this life. But aren't you glad God just doesn't leave us there? 
Not only does God make sure we know it exists, but he also makes sure we know how to respond to it. Let's look at our holy response. Verses number 31 and 32, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So what is our holy response To hurt. It's important for us to understand first that God deals with us as individuals. You know, Romans chapter 14 and verse number 12 reminds us that every one of us will give an account of himself to God. And so I'm not going to stand before God and talk about what a bad friend Bill Brown was. Because he's not a bad friend. But if he was, I still wouldn't do it. I'm not going to stand before God and say, you see, Lord, what had happened was Dan Utley did such and such, and so then I had to. No, we will stand before God and give an account of ourselves. I will give an account for me. You know, you look at these verses, and God doesn't spend a whole lot of time trying to unpack how you got hurt. God doesn't spend a whole lot of time trying to unpack why you have guilt or why you hold this grudge. But God does speak very clearly on what we're to do about it. In other words, what the Bible teaches us is you can't always control what you're handed in this life. But you do always have control over how you handle it. There is a distinctly Christian way to handle hurt. And you will give an answer for your response. What is that Christian response? Verse number one tells us, we are verse number 31 tells us that we are to cast off, that we are to violently reject out of hand bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and hatred. And that act of violently rejecting and casting off these things, this is up to you and you alone. You know, there are a lot of people that say, I wish I could forgive if they. No, this idea of forgiveness, of releasing, of letting go, has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you. It's important if we understand some distinctions here. You know, forgiveness is that release. It is that letting go. It is that giving up. You know, what we often confuse with forgiveness is reconciliation. That does take two. It does take two if, if Dan Utley is a bad friend and things are broken between us. It does take two for he and I to, to have a relationship again. You see, forgiveness, releasing our right to attitudes... Uh, to expectations of retribution or retaliation, releasing that is not the same as mending a relationship. Let me tell you one different even. We we talk about this idea uh, of reconciliation. Even this idea of restoration is different. You know, there, there would be an instance, can I tell you how Dan was a bad friend? Can I tell you how Dan was a bad friend? You want to hear how Dan was a bad friend? Okay, good. That's our deacon, Sam uh, Sam Mendoza, desiring to to hear gossip from the pulpit. Sounds like a good idea to me. So let me tell you how Dan was a bad friend. Dan stole. Dan stole Maddie's bubble gum. He literally took candy from my baby. Just kidding, but for sake of illustration. So, so just because Dan and I, reconciliation, we're going to say, okay, we need to get past this. You know, we need to find a way where we can continue to, to, to work together for Christ. That is even different than full restoration because you know what? That's going to take time. That's going to take a building of trust. You see, all of these things are different. I can't reconcile without Dan. There can't be restoration without Dan. But forgiveness has nothing to do with Dan. 
whatsoever. Nothing to do with Dan. It's up to you and you alone. Do you know why? Because that hurt, that wrong, that burden, that guilt, that that grudge that you feel, the hurt you have doesn't belong to you. That, that idea, that, that sense of an expectation of, of, of retribution or restitution, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Look at verses like Romans chapter 12 and verse number 19 where we see, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. A similar verse in Hebrews 10 and verse number 30 where the Bible says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It goes all the way back to control issues. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. Let me touch on another subject here. So a lot of people have a hard time, quote, forgiving themselves. Right? You with me? Now, a lot of things we could go into, but I just simply want to deal with it from a Christian perspective. You have a hard time forgiving yourself over some past sin or some past wrong. Can I let you in on a little secret? It doesn't belong to you anymore. He paid for it. He paid for it. It doesn't belong to you. He bore it in his body on the tree. First, first Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24. It doesn't belong to you. And you see, it robs us of our peace because we try to hold on because we feel it's ours. But it's not. It's his. And so we're told to cast off, to violently reject out of hand bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and hatred because it belongs to God. And I'm going to tell you the other end of it. You holding on to this is sin. It's not Dan's sin. He may have stole the bubble gum from my baby, but this isn't Dan's sin. This is my sin. And you cannot, you cannot harbor this sin and be right with God. You remember from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and verse number 15, where the Bible says, But if ye forgive men not their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses trespasses. Sin will always rob you of the peace of God. So church, so Christian, we can't blame anybody else. This concept of forgiveness, release, letting go, lies squarely at our feet. So we see the negative here to reject all of these things. But not only are we commanded to put off bitterness, but we are commanded, ooh, this is what gets me, to heap on blessing. Not only are we commanded to put off bitterness, we're commanded to heap on blessing. Verse number 32, and be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted. You know, that idea of being kind means to be usefully good. So we are to interject ourselves in such a way that we are usefully good. How many, how many other people find that tough? We're to be tender hearted. It means sympathetic. It's hard to be sympathetic to the people you want to hold accountable for your hurt. But the Bible is clear. Heap on blessing. Heap on blessing. Heap on blessing. What did Jesus say? To pray for them, to do good to them, to bless them. Heap it on. That we are not to return evil for evil, but are to do good. Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 19 through 21. We looked at 19 earlier, but I want you to see the progression here. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy be hungry, what is it, church? If he thirst... For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Verse number 21. Be not overcome with evil, but, say it with me, 
overcome evil with good. We are not to be overcome with evil, but we are to overcome evil with good. This church is the distinctly Christian response. Now, I want you to see how the Apostle Paul brings this, because that's hard, right? That's hard. That's hard. Because after Dan hurt my baby the way he did, it's hard for me to be want to be, want to be usefully good in his life. It's hard for me to want to be sympathetic. It's hard for me to want to have anything to do with somebody that's hurt me. It's hard. But you see how Paul ends this verse? Verse 32, it says, And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We've seen our human reality. We've seen our holy response. You cannot miss, though, our humbling reason. What is the reason we can act like this? You know, if only we had an example to follow, right? If only we had an example of someone who had every right to be offended. If only we had the example of someone who had every right to be distant and pull away. Who had every right to hold a grudge. Who had every right to hate. And yet, who chose to forgive. But we do have an example, don't we? You know, I think a lot of times the church of Jesus Christ would do well to quit sitting around pondering what would Jesus do and simply do what Jesus did. You look at the cross, Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34, as Jesus hung and bled on the cross, as he became my sin, my inexcusable sin, what had he ever done to me that I should choose to offend him like that? As he hung on the cross to pay for my inexcusable sin, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You look at verse like 1 Peter chapter number 1, beginning in verse, chapter 2, I'm sorry, beginning in verse number 21. Speaking of Jesus, it says, For even here and too are ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. You with me, church? Who, who did no guile, no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Verse number 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself. To him that judges righteously. What an example we have. What an example we have. You think not only of the example of Christ, but to the extent that Jesus forgave us. You know, Christ and his cross show both the example and the extent of forgiveness that we are to give. What have you done that Christ has not forgiven you for? You know, God's design is that grace would not only flow to us, but then once it has flowed to us in salvation, that it would then flow, flow through us to others. And church, we can forgive because we are forgiven. We can forgive exceeding great hurt and exceeding great sin because we have been forgiven exceeding great sin. And the forgiveness that we give to others should reflect the forgiveness that we have received. I want you to think about this, church. It is inconceivable to me. It is incompatible with Christian living that we should be easily offended who so easily received forgiveness. It's incompatible with following Jesus Christ that we should be so frequently offended when we are so fully forgiven. It just doesn't fit that we could be so deeply offended who are so deeply forgiven. 
Church, when we consider the cross of Jesus Christ, it just doesn't fit that we can allow ourselves to live in perpetual offense when we have the privilege of living in perpetual forgiveness. And the example and the extent is clear that we as Christ followers are called to forgive as we have been forgiven. No caveats, no asterisk, no way out. Forgive as you are forgiven. Colossians 3 and verse number 13 puts this way, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And the very next verse I didn't give them is about putting on charity, which is the bond of peace. Charity. Our humbling reason. You know, this letting go, this releasing, this forgiving, this laying down our right to hold attitudes of resentment, this laying down our right to hold expectations of retaliation or, or expectations of restitution. Church, let me encourage you tonight. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that it didn't affect us deeply. But here's what it does mean. It does mean that for those of us who name the name of Christ, for those of us who've been born again into the family of God, for those of us who have the Spirit of God living within us, it does mean that the hurt, the guilt, the grudge doesn't get to define us because we get to give it up and give it over to the one whom it really belongs to. I want to encourage you tonight. That offense, it was an event. Maybe it was events, but it was things that happened to you. The offense was an event. Offended is a choice. To live offended is a choice. Christian forgiveness brings God's peace. Because it shifts our heart from what someone did to us to what the Savior did for us. Forgiveness brings God's peace because it shifts our focus from the bad of our past to the blessings of our present and our future. And I'm going to tell you, this thing of forgiveness, this thing of release, oftentimes it is a moment-by-moment moment struggle. But victory and peace is possible through Christ. And if we are going to pursue the peace God has promised us, we cannot pursue peace and ignore this concept, this topic, this truth of forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you tonight, from the moment we said the word forgive, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has already brought to your mind that person. The Holy Spirit has already brought to your mind that event. The Holy Spirit has already brought to your mind that baggage, that burden. The Holy Spirit has already brought that to your mind. And so the invitation tonight is would you respond to God in such a way that you would leave with God that which rightly belongs to Him? You know what, you may do it tonight and before you get home, before you get out of the car, you might have to bow your head and give it again, let it go again, release it again, give it up again. Because you know what, a, a great word for this idea of bitterness is stuck. And it's almost like the current keeps pulling you back. But greater is he within you than he that is in the world. And so you just keep letting it go. You just keep releasing, you just keep forgiving, you just keep putting it in the hands of him that it belongs to. And you know what you will find? You will find as you walk this road of life that God will bring you victory, that God will give you peace. Tonight, will you commit to leave with God that which rightly belongs to him? Would you consecrate yourself to asking the Holy Spirit to bring his healing and his peace?
our God's grace and our God's peace is bigger, is greater than any offense we carry. Amen? And let's leave it with him tonight. Father.